Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm going to talk to you about more in 24, more in 2024. And when I say more in 2024, I'm not talking about more money, though we won't turn God down if he brings in more money. In fact, let's say when he brings in more money, we won't turn that down. But that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about more pleasure. I'm talking about more of God and more of God's will. This world is going to pass away quickly. In fact, the Bible says this world is passing away. This world is passing away. It's eternity that we have to have in view. And we want the will of God to come to pass. At the end, when we look into the face of Jesus, we want him to say, well done. Well done. Good servant and faithful servant. Isn't that right? This is, this is where we have our sights. This is what we have on our hearts. Are we going to get well done? Or is Jesus going to say, well? <laughs> I think he's going to look at some people and say, well? Not well done, just well? <laughs> uh, here you are. <laughs> I don't want that, do you? I want well done. Well, that means we have to do well. We have to do well. Thank God. So let's look at this here. More in 24. More of God. More of his will. Let's look at this verse. Precious verse. Let's read this all out loud from the New King James Version. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Reading loudly and together. Let's read. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now let me say it back to you. Let's go a little slower. For we, who is we? We is not everybody on the planet or everybody who ever lived. This is talking about born again people. For we are God's workmanship. He created us, right? Notice, but this says created in Christ Jesus. So this is talking about born again people. People who are in Jesus. They've had a change in their spirits. They've gone from death to life. They have eternal life inside through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, through their confession and their following of Jesus. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now watch this. For something. We were not just created to be. We were also created to do. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works and not just any good works. These are not good works that we get to choose or decide on. No, we were created for good works which God prepared beforehand. These works are done. These works are settled. God is not figuring the plan of our lives out as we go along. Oh, Lord, I'm in this situation. Now what's your will? No, His will has been established. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life. And we need to walk in that plan. So it says, which God prepared beforehand that we, watch this, should, 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 what does that mean? There's a choice. That we should walk in them. We should. We should. Now, many believers have embraced a lie that precludes them from walking out the plan of God. And let me tell you what this one, there are many lies, but let me tell you about a big one. It's a lie that says, well, if it's God's will, it'll happen. Well, if it's God's will, it'll happen. Like, no matter what I do, the will of God for my life is going to happen. And everything that happens to me, well, it must be the will of God. I don't know why this tragedy happened in my life, but God knows, you know, I believe there's a reason for everything, somebody says. I believe there's a reason for everything. Well, I believe there's a reason for everything too, but I don't believe your reason and my reason is always the same. Because Peter said, be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom 
he may devour. And then Peter said, resist him steadfast in the faith. Well, what happens if you don't resist him? Then he'll devour. Well, was that the will of God? No, the will of God was you resist him. But if you don't resist him, he'll devour you. And it's unnecessary. And it's not the will of God. Is that right? James says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Well, what happens if you don't resist him? And you just go with his temptations to walk in the flesh, to walk in sin. What happens if you don't resist him? Then you're going to get the consequences of sin. Well, I don't know why this is happening to me. It's happening because you did not resist the devil. It's not the will of God. The will of God was that you resist the devil. Amen. And have him flee. But if you don't resist the devil, there will be consequences of that. And if you say, well, I don't know why this is happening to me. Well, it's your ignorance. It is not God. It's not the will of God. There's this big lie that everything that happens must have been the will of God. That's not true. Jesus said the thief doesn't come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Well, is that the will of God? That Satan steals, kills, and destroys in your life? No. That's why Jesus has given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Remember Luke uh, 10, 19, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the devil, the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Well, what happens if you don't use that authority? He's going to trample over you. He's going to steal, kill, and destroy in your life. And it's your fault. It's not God's will. Amen. It's not God's will. See, so this complacency that happens with believers because they think, well, if it's God's will, it's going to happen. You know, we just do the best we can, and then God's going to decide ultimately. That's not true. The devil thinks he can decide. If you don't decide to go with the will of God and to use your armor and to use your authority and to pray and do the things you need to do, the devil will decide. And let me tell you, that's the one guy you don't want to decide. Isn't that right? He always decides the wrong thing. Even if it looks good at first, it will be the wrong thing. Devastating. Devastating. So we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Most believers do not. Most people in the world do not walk in them. Many believers don't even know God has a plan for their life. But look, the Bible says it right here. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand. My good works are different than yours. You may not be called to do what I do. But thank God I'm not called to do what you do because I wouldn't be able to do it. God hasn't gifted me and graced me to be able to do your calling. I wouldn't be able to hold up to it if I tried. And you wouldn't be able to hold up to mine because you're not gifted in grace to do it. But you are gifted. And you are graced to do what God has called you to do. Isn't that right? And the devil will try to tell you, oh, you've sinned too much. You waited too long. You have this deficiency and that deficiency. Did you know deficiencies are completely irrelevant? In fact, the Bible says God chooses the foolish. Isn't that right? Tell the person next to you, there's hope for you. (laughs) Isn't that right? The Bible says God chooses the weak. Do you remember Gideon? He had 32,000 troops going against 135,000 Midianites. And God said, you got too many. (laughs) What, can God not count? God said, no, it's not about what you have. I'm the one that's going to do it. And if you win with 32,000 against 135,000, you'll just think you guys are bad. You'll take the glory for yourself. So I'm going to cut you down, cut him all the way down to 300. Isn't that right? It doesn't matter how good you are, how gifted you are, how strong you are, what a great track record you have. God wants it to be him. So no matter what your deficiencies are, you're not eloquent, you're not educated, you're not this, you're not that, you're in debt or whatever. None of that matters. You look to God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He can supply and will supply everything you need and more so. Isn't that right? See, so the will of God doesn't always happen, but it will happen for people who choose to walk in the will of God. 
Let me give you one more scripture. Well, two. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not willing for anyone to die and go to hell. Not the will of God. But his will is that all should come to repentance. Isn't that right? Well, 1 Timothy 2.4 says God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So it's the will of God that every single human being that ever lives repents, is forgiven by Jesus and his grace, and has eternal life and has these good works. Isn't that right? But are they all going to come? No. Are they all going to repent? No. No. What is... What did Jesus say? Jesus said, broad is the gate and wide is the path that leads to destruction. And many people go in into that gate. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And only a few people find it. But that's not the will of God. But that is what's going to happen. God, Jesus is just telling that even though he came and died for the whole world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That doesn't mean the entire world is going to hear the gospel and humble themselves under the hand of their creator and say, you know better than me. You are in charge. I believe you, not what I think or what I can prove. But the arrogance of people and the self-sufficiency that they have in their heart, like I, I, I can control my own destiny, and they can. God will allow them to, to their own demise. But I'm telling you, the point is this. The will of God does not automatically come to pass. But God is putting it out in front of us and saying, I want my will to come to pass for your life, but you're going to have to choose it. And by choosing the will of God, that means you're also going to have to choose not to do other things that you would like to do. Isn't that right? Sometimes we look at a certain person and we think, oh, man, I want to be like that. And we start emulating them. But that may not be the will of God for our lives. Or we get, some people I've seen certain believers say, man, I'm called to do this. I, I want to do this. I want to be a worship leader and I want to lead thousands and thousands. OK, but is that God's will? Or would that just make you feel fulfilled? It's not about feeling fulfilled. People spend their whole lives chasing something that's not the will of God. We need to know, God, what do you want me to do? It doesn't matter how popular I am, how esteemed I am, how known I am. Am I doing what you've called me to do? Is that right? Amen. See, in the Bible, it talks about how we're different parts of the body of Christ. You may be an internal organ, a vital organ, but it's not seen. You're not to be known. You're just to play your part. Why? It's the will of God and it pleases the Lord. See, so we have to not let this world system of aspiring to things and why well, can be anything I want to be. I, lo I love the way Kimberly would speak to our kids growing up. She'd tell them from little. And, and they say, I want to be you know, a pilot. I want to be a fireman or whatever. And Kimberly would say, you can be anything God wants you to be. <laughs> Snuck that in there. Isn't that right? You can be anything God wants you to be. <laughs> and that's also saying very clearly, but you can't be anything God doesn't want you to be. Isn't that right? But we need to raise up kids. God has a plan for you already. That's the one. Yeah, and you can be anything in that. Amen. And that's you. God's got one plan for you. That's the one. And we need to be willing to sacrifice the rest. Isn't that right? And if you're not, then you're like the rich young ruler, clinging to something. And by walking away from the will of God, day after day, you tell God, you're not that important to me. What I want is more important. And let me tell you, that's eternally devastating. That's eternally devastating. What an insult to your loving creator. So 
God has prepared these works for us to do, and we need to do them. This is what I'm talking about with more in 24. God, I want to get down the road with your will for my life. I want to walk in the flesh much less and walk in the spirit much more. I want to yield myself and humble myself to you. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9.24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. So Paul is saying it's not enough to say, yeah, I'm running. You're running, but you're like a thousand yards behind where you ought to be. Paul said, no, run like run to win. And we're not competing with each other. It's not like only one of us can win. No, I can win my race. I'm in a race against the temptations of the devil and all of the distractions of other things that I could do in life that are not the will of God. I've got to outrun them. Say, no, no, I'm not doing that. But Paul said, you have to run. You have to be like an athlete that disciplines himself. He, can't, he doesn't just eat anything he wants to eat anytime he wants to eat it. And that means consuming things in our eyes and ears and hearts. We can't just live any way we want to live and win. We have to make hard choices and put the prize of fulfilling the plan of God as our highest priority. Now, listen, listen to somebody who did it better than anybody. His name is Jesus. Did you know Jesus had a plan for his life? Did you know when he came to the earth, he wasn't just saying, well, you know, what? just, okay, let's just see, see what's going on here. And then Holy Spirit, what should we do? Did you know there was already a plan for his life? Much of it is scripted in the Old Testament. Is that right? Things that he couldn't control. Like he's going to be born of a virgin. Well, that wasn't a decision he's going to make. Okay, ready? I'm ready to be born of a virgin. <laughs> no. I mean, that's something that had to come to pass when he first came. And then everything from resisting temptation his whole life, Jesus didn't sin even one time. And the Bible says he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. And so here's somebody who, I mean, completely gave himself to the plan of God, sacrificed anything he thought he wanted that was outside of that plan and said, no, if it's not part of the plan for my life, I'm not going to do it. And he did not succumb even one time. And think about the plan for his life. After not yielding to any temptation, physical temptations, heart temptations, things I want to think, things I just want to look at, after not yielding to any of those, then the plan for his life is to be killed as if you succumb to every temptation that every human being who ever lived or will live, that's going to come on you. And you're going to shut your mouth and take it. That's my plan for you. That was what was scripted for him to do. And he yielded to it. Is that right? He yielded to it. He was not the most popular person in the world. The emperor of Rome was far more popular than he. Isn't that right? That was not his mission. His mission was a very humble, unfair mission, but it was necessary. Isn't that right? And listen to what Jesus said. This is one of my favorite things Jesus ever said. It was the night before he died at the Last Supper when he began to pray. And it says in John 17, 4, he said this to his father. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Oh, I tell you, this is precious. He said, here, here are the two things that I was able to do in these last 33 years. Number one, I glorified you. Didn't Jesus always talk about the father? For the Father himself loves you. Fear not, little flock, for it gives your Father great pleasure to give you the kingdom. When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He was constantly glorifying the Father, not himself. They had a hard time even getting him to admit, Are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? I mean, tell us, tell us. It's what you said. <laughs> We're asking you, can't you just say, I am the Messiah? 
No, he was bringing glory to the Father. To the Father. His job was not to glorify himself and to make himself known. No, his job was to bring glory to the Father. He said, I've glorified you in the earth. Isn't that right? And then he said, not only have I brought glory to you, but I have finished the work you've given me to do. Not somebody else's job. I finished it. And it's not, it's not a desirable plan. Thank God none of us have to do that. Amen? Amen. But he did it. He did it. So he said these two things. I have given glory to you on the earth. I have glorified you on the earth. And number two, I finished the work you've given me to do. And years ago, I saw this, and I thought, that's what I want to be able to say at the end of my life. Number one, I gave glory to you. I told everybody I could about you and how you are and your faithfulness and how gracious you are, how merciful you are, how powerful you are, how faithful you are. But I also want to finish the work that you've given me to do. Some people, they, they feel like the ultimate is, we're just going to worship God. We're going to worship God. Well, you need to do that. You need to do that. But there's also an assignment you have to complete. Your assignment is not just to worship God. You know, some people, you know, if we don't watch ourselves, we'll live in a little bubble with just us and God, and we'll go on into heaven and to H-E-double-L with everybody else. But that's not how Jesus was. Jesus didn't want anybody to go to hell. Jesus wanted everybody to know. Isn't that right? So we have to live like Jesus. We have an assignment. And if, if you don't know what that assignment was or, or is, and you say, well, I, I don't know what to do, well, ask him. You see right here in the word, you have one? Ask him. If it's not important enough to seek him about it, to ask him about it, well, how are you going to find out? If anyone lacks wisdom, James 1.5 says, let him ask God who gives to all liberally and without reproaching, it will be given. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 say, and don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Isn't that right? He's told us that he will tell us, he will lead us, but we have to seek him. It's not going to just come to us. The will of God is not automatic. Now, there are some things in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, that's going to come to pass. I don't care how hard you pray. That is, God said, that is how it ends. Isn't that right? You can't pray that away. But the majority of things that are going on in this world, horrible things, and just, just people that, even believers in Jesus, who are not doing the will of God in their life, they're just kind of plugging along, thinking if they just go to church occasionally that they're all right, but they're not doing the will of God in their lives. That is unacceptable. This is why you're going to have more in 2024. Amen. Why is that? Because God's speaking to us and God's alerting us and saying, you and me, we're together here, 2024. We're going to walk close. Somebody say amen to this. Amen. We're going to walk together. We're going to walk together. God's going to do it. This is what Paul said. This is not easy. This is what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 7. At the end of his life, he said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. He's not telling us, and it was easy. Now, it wasn't easy. No, he said, it's a fight. We got to fight. Our, we got to fight the devil and demonic forces, but we also have to fight against the will of man, other people's opinions of what we ought to do. Isn't that right? But I got to fight my own flesh. Isn't that right? My own flesh. My own flesh will not do the will of God. It just wants to eat whatever it wants to eat, however much of it it wants to eat. It wants to look at, watch, listen to, say whatever it wants to watch and listen to and say. Isn't that right? And we have to tell the flesh, no, no, no. And this is where, here's a modern term, we need to identify with our born-again spirit. Many believers, in fact, people that have been caught up in the deception of 
sins, some of the modern things that happen, LGBT things, same-sex things, transgender things. Is, it, I'm talking about believers. I'm not talking about unbelievers. You know, unbelievers, we, we understand unbelievers, but believers being caught up in this. It's because they've been sold a lie to say, well, be true to yourself. So if you have these feelings, well, just admit it. This is who you are. This is how you are. Well, wait a minute. I have conflicting feelings. When you're born again, you have conflicting feelings. There's a part of you that wants to just submit to God and obey him and be who he wants you to be. But then there's another part. And the Bible is clear about this. Isn't that right? Paul in Romans chapter 7, there's, there's, there's something in my members warring against the law of my mind and, and trying to bring me into captivity to sin. Oh, there's conflict. If you're born again, there is a conflict inside. So here's the question. Which one are you going to identify with and say it's you? Isn't that right? Think of any Christian married man or woman. But let's just take a man. And here's a man that may feel an attraction towards someone that's not his wife. All right, so should he be true to himself? Well, I just need, that's just how I am. <laughs> no, you better not. Is that right? No, because that's the flesh, and the flesh just, and the carnal mind just goes over the lines constantly. We have to say, no, that's not me. That's not who I am. That's my flesh. Uh-uh. That's not the real me is this born-again person inside. The real me is the one who wants to honor God and be right with God. See, you need to identify. This is what changed my life. You need to identify with the born-again part of you. The Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Well, they're still hanging around. Yeah, but, but see, once you identify with the new man and you begin to say, no, I'm the new man. No, I reject that. I'm the new man. Let me tell you, your life is a whole different life now. Because now you're telling your flesh, uh-uh, you shut up because you were crucified with Christ. I traded you in for a new man. Isn't that right? You died on the cross. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. See, and you identify with the new man. And you say, this is who I am. I'm born again. See, this is, this is why your 2024 is going to be different. Because your flesh and your mind want to do other things. And, and you're not being true to yourself. That's being true to the flesh and the carnality. No, you need to be true to who you are. You have been changed. You have been saved. You have been born again inside. And you, you need to say, that's who I am. Just say it out loud. In the name of Jesus, I am a born again believer in Jesus. I'm the righteousness of God. I'm obedient to God. I humbly submit to God. That's the way I am. That's who I am. And therefore, that's what I'll do. See, you talk like that and believe like that. And let me tell you, your flesh just sits on the side and says, mm. say, well, you just whine all you want to, but you're not going to get your way because you're not in charge anymore. There's a born again spirit in here connected with God. All right. Now, let me give you 12 ways. Here we go. I got to go fast. 12 ways that you can have more in 24 the way we're talking about here. And by the way, we put this on a website called I want more in 24.com. <laughs> And that's not a joke. I want more in 24.com. We put all these 12 ways here. All right, let me give you number one. Number one, make time for daily Bible reading. Notice, make time. Well, I don't have time. Make time. By the way, that's a lie that you don't have time. That's a lie because I'm pretty sure you get 24 hours a day and seven days a week. Nobody gets more and nobody gets less. We may all have varying levels of income financially, but when it comes to time, we all get paid the exact same. You got 24 a day. How you spend it is what you choose, but you do have time. You do have time, and you get to choose how you spend that time. And I'm telling you, number one, you need to make time for daily Bible reading. Now, why is that? 
Well, Psalm 119, verse 130 is where the psalmist said to God, he said, he said, your, the entrance of your words gives light. The entrance of your words gives light. The entrance of your words gives light. Let me give you an example of this. Have you ever had somebody come and tell you something that happened and, and you think and you may even say out loud, I can't believe they did that. Why would they do that? Why would they do that? And then later somebody else comes and says, well, let me tell you what happened. And they explain the situation. Is that, oh, 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 I'd have done the same thing. See, yesterday you were all cocky. Why would they do that? And then when you hear the rest of the story, now all of a sudden you're like, oh, I would have done the same thing. Why? Because some additional words brought light to the situation. And this is what happens with God's word. When God speaks, he speaks with insight and knowledge of everything. And so when his words come into our hearts and minds, we begin to see how things really operate and what's really driving things to happen or not to happen. And, and when we see that light, it, it changes our perspective to the right perspective. Now, listen to what it says in Psalm 36, 9. Psalm 36, 9. This is where the psalmist said to God, for with you is the fountain of life. Now listen to this last phrase. In your light, we see light. In your light, we see light. So when you bring the word of God into your heart and mind and things brighten up, you see things. I cannot tell, I have no idea how many hundreds or thousands of times this has happened to me. That when I'm in God's word, hearing, listening, reading God's word, the light of God is coming in. All of a sudden, I understand the situation I'm in right then. I know what to do. I see the problem. Because in your light, we see light. I see it. I see it. I got it. I got it. I see it. This is how we're supposed to live. Because the world we're in is dark. You listen to the rhetoric of the world, the news and, and stuff that's going on. No matter which news you choose, there are lies in there. Are you hearing me? No matter what you choose, there are lies in there. But when you come to the Word, I remember Smith Wigglesworth, some of you know him, I mean, just powerhouse with the Lord many years now. But uh, I believe it was Lester Summerall, who, who's also with the Lord. He, he shows up uh, to Smith Wigglesworth, Smith Wigglesworth's home to be mentored by him and such, and a newspaper tucked up under his arm like this. And Smith Wigglesworth opened the door and he said, Throw that, throw those lies away. You're not bringing those lies into my house. <laughs> he is bold. He's bold. In this house, we're going to read the truth. And that's the word of God. This, this is what Peter said. This is the light that shines in a dark place. This is what we can depend on. No matter how true you think something else is, you can't depend on it. There are lies in there. Lies, and people have just chased those and chased those all the time. We need to know what God said. We need to know what God said. So let me tell you, number one, the most important thing I'll tell you, and there's a second, and that's the prayer. The most important thing I'll tell you is every day you need to let God speak his word into you. 2 Timothy 3.16 says in the NIV, all scripture is breathed out by God is breathed out by God, not was breathed out, and now it's stale. Mm -mm. It is breathed out by God. The ESV says all Scripture is God-breathed. He's still exhaling His Word. So every time you read His Word, if you'll open your heart, the breath of God is coming into you. The wisdom of God is flowing through you. And let me tell you, you can't do that every day and not be changed. You will be lifted. Your life will be lifted. You cannot have the breath of God and the words of God breathing into you every day and ha not have your life lifted. It is impossible. It is impossible. And this is why the enemy fights it so hard. This is why he distracts you and gets you to think you don't have time. You do have time. We do have time. We make time. Why? Because we believe no one has the answers like God. God has the answers. Now, the second is daily journaling. It's not the most important second. Prayer is. We're going to get to that. 
And somebody, I'm sure, walked in here and said, hey, where's my journal? Because for the past 15, maybe almost 20 years, uh, the last weekend of the month, we give away a free journal with Bible reading plans to everybody. But, but we didn't do it this year. Pastor Carl decided that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I could blame it on Pastor Carl, but I can't. <laughs> no. No, we decided not to print journals. Maybe ever again. It's unscriptural. No, I'm just kidding. It's not unscriptural. <laughs> no, here's why. Because uh, things have changed over the years, and y'all aren't buying journals like you used to. You know, we used to give away journals, thousands of journals. The last of the year, we just give them away and such. And then throughout the year, people would come back to replace their journal and buy them or whatever. Well, I mean, that's happening less and less as the years go on. More people are using electronic journals, we believe, and not using paper journals. And I have been doing the same thing. Why? Because I've got a stack of journals this big in my office, but I can't carry it with me. I can't reference them so easily. But I use an electronic journal because I can reference it. I can look things up just very quickly by date, or I can tag it and such. So there's so many advantages. So I've been doing that. And apparently, many others have been doing that as well. So we didn't go through the expense to do that because we don't want to waste the Lord's money. But let me tell you, the, the great benefit of the journals was not so much the paper, but it's the Bible reading plans. It's the Bible reading plans. Well, those are available. We've updated those for this year, and we've made them available all over the place. So you don't lack those in any way. In fact, let me tell you this, that if you have a phone or a tablet, you can go to the most popular Bible app in the world, the version, little brown Bible, version Bible app, and you'll now, instead of searching for solid lives, now you'll search for Jesus' disciple. Why? Because we used to do Operation Solid Lives, and so we had those Bible reading plans with solid lives, but now we've got Jesus' disciple out there. So this is what we're calling people to and such. So if you go to the Version Bible app and you search for the plans, reading plans, for Jesus' disciple, you'll see all of our plans come up. We've got a New Testament plan, one chapter a day. We've got the whole Bible plan, which is about three chapters, sometimes four a day. And then we've got the one-two plan, which is what I like to do. It's what I finished yesterday. The one-two plan, you read through the whole Bible in a year, but the New Testament twice. So it's a little more reading, four chapters a day, five, and, and I've noticed some days recently, six chapters in a day, but normally shorter chapters. And so those are, the, those are there. They're available. they got the checklist and all that. You can do that. But also, if you go to the Rock app, you, you'll come down to a banner that says Bible reading, and we've got options there to just walk you through whatever Bible reading you have. Solid Lives app, the same thing. On your computer, you can go to Bible.com, which is the version website of their app. You can go to go to the rock.com. We put the Bible reading plans there and solidlives.com. You can download the PDF version if you want. In other words, we put them everywhere. We put them all over the place so that people would have these. The only thing we haven't provided is a, a journal to write on, but you can do that with any tablet or notebook, or you can do, use your notes on your iPhone or, or however the Androids do it. They're. <laughs> which are the majority of you, I know. But nonetheless, you can find ways to journal. But read the Bible every day. And why do you want to journal? Because when God speaks something to you about your life, it's important. That's the creator God speaking, so write it down. All right, let me get to number three, daily prayer. And this is, this is highly important, daily prayer. Paul said in Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Now, number one is we need God to speak to us. Why? Well, because he already knows everything you know. It is you who need to know what he knows. Isn't that right? So first, we need to hear from God. We need his light. Then you'll even know how to pray. Right? So we need to hear from God. We need to let him speak to us. But then we need to pray and respond. We need to speak to him. We need to bless him. We need to use the name of Jesus, use our authority. 
If we don't use our authority, then we're leaving out what God is offering to us in his word, what he's saying to us. But God has given us promises, exceedingly great and precious promises. And so God wants us to speak and to receive them and to use the name of Jesus. Now, if you don't know what to pray, let me encourage you with several things. Number one, walk through the Lord's Prayer, but don't walk through it as just repeating the words like a parrot. What? Our Father which art in heaven. What? Hallowed be your name. What? Your kingdom come and your will be done. <laughs> Jesus said, don't pray with just vain repetition. Isn't that right? Jesus was giving us a model of prayer. You start and say, our Father in heaven. So you automatically, our Father. It's not just me and God. There's a body here that I'm a part of. Our Father. See, every, every word is important. Our Father in heaven. Oh, you're not just a human being here on the earth. You're the God of heaven. Hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. Holy is your name. Now, of course, Jesus was teaching us to pray to the Father. But, of course, since then, Philippians says, God has raised Jesus up and made him sit in heavenly places and given him the name above every name. Isn't that right? And every knee should bow and confess that he's Lord. So he's seated right there at the right hand, which is to my left. So I honor the Father and worship him and then say, Lord Jesus, bless you and your precious name, the name of Jesus. Isn't that right? And honor him and bless him and worship him. See, hallowed be your name. And then go on to the next. Your kingdom come. Lord, more than my desires in life, Lord, the most important thing is that your kingdom come to this earth. Every person receives your kingdom and comes under the rulership of King Jesus, and your will be done. See, Jesus taught us to pray this. Don't start with yourself. Start with the highest priorities. God himself and his will and his kingdom coming. And then Jesus said, then come down, give us this day our daily bread, Lord, meet our needs. If you're in debt, say, Lord, thank you for paying these debts off. Is that right? See, then you pray that, and all the way down to forgive us our debts, our sins, as we forgive others. Jesus, just, you know, just start there. Walk through this and do it from the heart. Do it from the heart, not a repetition. This is a real being, a spirit. You were born again of his spirit. I, I, you know, when I'm by myself, Kimberly's usually upstairs praying and doing her devotions, and I'm downstairs. But when I lift my hands, I often think about the two prongs of an electrical plug plugging into the outlet. And I lift my hands up, and from my heart, I begin to talk and connect with the Lord. I mean, sincerely. He knows when it's sincere or when you're just getting through something. He knows. And when I just, down deep inside, say, Lord, I love you today. I need you today. I call upon you today. Let me tell you, it's like Scripture says, deep calls unto deep. The depth of your spirit reaches into the depths of God's spirit, and there's a connection. Let me tell you, that's where the life is. It's with you and your God who loves you, not going through rituals and routines but connecting with the real person of God. See, not just a book, but him saying things to you. See, that's why we say this is my Bible. is God speaking to me. Okay, so daily prayer. Number four, New Testament daily. I'll just hit this quickly, but if you'd like, if you're, if you'd like somebody just to walk you through the chapters of the New Testament as you're going through your uh, daily Bible reading, well, I'll do that with you. It's all recorded there. It's on the Rock app. It's on the Solid Lives app under Bible reading. It's on YouTube, uh, my YouTube and such. But just walk through and have somebody help you and guide you to understand the gist of it. It's not exhaustive, but it, but it just helps you understand the gist of it. Number five, attend church regularly. Attend, attend church. How many of you know just sitting in this atmosphere right here, just going over these scriptures, it recalibrates you, doesn't it? It just, it just puts the priorities back into alignment. And that's what attending church does. You come into this atmosphere. We honor God. We worship him. We get our attention on him. We open his word. 
and somebody shares the word with us, and it just recalibrates us. And inside, anybody that's been with the Lord a while, you say, that's right. Oh, that's right. I, I knew that, but that's right. I need to do that. This is what this is for. This is what this is for, but do it regularly, not just when you get a chance. No, you make the chance. You say, no, this is what keeps us aligned. You know, when you fly a commercial jet, boy, my time's slipping away. You guys are taking long, too long to learn this. <laughs> <laughs> when you fly a commercial jet, did you know when they put it on autopilot, it's not a laser beam to the destination. The wind will bump the plane out of, you know, uh, out of its trajectory, and autopilot will correct it. And there's a constant correction that's going on, and that's what happens when we come together. It's what happens daily in the Word and prayer. But that's also what happens when we come together is you have some help to recalibrate. And let me tell you, you get down the road if you correct more often. Okay, now, uh, let me hit the rest of these because they're not as important for us to hit as much as the ones we've already hit. But listen to Bible teachings during the week. This changed my life. Don't just listen at church, but man, during the week, listen to messages. We're going to make that easier in the next few months. Number seven, Jesus' disciple group. Oh my goodness, this is powerful. Instead of having to come to church on a certain day to take an OSL level uh, discipleship, no. Go to JesusDisciple.com, create a group, invite people to come, and when you meet together for the first time and go through the orientation video, the questions will be answered, you'll get it, and then you're being discipled, but you're making disciples of others. This, this will change your life in 2024. Number eight, speak words of love and life and not death. Speak words of love and life and not death. This is true in any area with your finances. I don't care how bad your finances are. Did you know that you don't have to say, oh, man, we're broke. Oh, man, debt's getting bigger. We'll never get out of debt. You don't have to say that. I don't. Well, my parents always said that. I thought I had to say that. You don't, even if it's true, even if it looks like it's true. Did you know you don't have to say that? One option is you can shut up. Isn't that right? But here's another option. The second option is you can open your mouth and speak something that will overrule what ha what's going on in your life. It's not denial. You're not denying that those things are there. But you're just saying, I'm not limited by what's happening because I have a God who is powerful and can overrule this. Isn't that right? See, but you have to choose to not speak what you think, and not just be a thermometer that just tells the temperature. God has called your mouth to be a thermostat that said, well, it may be 89 degrees right now, but I'm speaking that I want this at 70. Is that right? See, and your mouth can take the word of God and invoke the power of God to change what's happening in your life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Kimberly and I, this is one of the big reasons why we have a good, enjoyable marriage. We refuse to speak just whatever comes to mind to and about to each other. You know, you can pick a person apart every day if you just speak what, what you see, the deficiencies and all that. Of course, she doesn't see many in me, but <laughs> that's a lie. That's a lie. No, but you, you know, you can, just, you can just tear a person down. Isn't that right? You can tear a person down. You know, did you know you don't have to do that just because you see deficiency? Did you know you don't have to say, I don't? I don't have to say that. Well, my parents always did that. Did they have a wonderful marriage? No. <laughs> that the kind you want? What did, what did God tell husbands? Love your wives as Christ loved the church. And when you see spots and blemishes, wash them away with the water the, of the rhema word of God, the spoken word of God. You can speak encouraging things, loving things. Isn't that right? Think about how God speaks to us, how much he loves us and everything, and just saying, yeah, you blew it again. You blew it now, now, again, again. Oh, look at that. Look, you again, again. Can you imagine if God did that to us all day long, nitpicked us? Be horrible. It would destroy us and certainly destroy our relationship with him. He speaks loving, kind words to us, gracious words, encouraging words to build us up. Is that right? See, we choose to do it. It doesn't come natural. You choose to do it. 
but it'll make for a, a better 2024. Okay, here we go. Operation Healthy Lives. You saw Adrian up here on the screens. And they not only help you with eating and exercise, but they, help, they fill you with the Word of God, too, about what the Bible says. Number 10, fasting and praying. Don't listen to your flesh. Don't listen to your flesh. You know what my flesh says? Two things about fasting. Number one, I fast fast. In fact, I'm already done, right? <laughs> and number two, I'm fasting fasting this year. <laughs> you can't listen to your flesh. No, your flesh just wants to eat. Isn't that right? No, you have to, from your spirit, say, look, I need some breakthrough here, and I need to set aside food, and I need to get in and seek God and hear from God and get some breakthrough. God listens. Number 11, start tithing. Don't wait. Number 12, be intentional to watch less secular media. Mm-hmm. How many of you say, mm-hmm, for the people sitting around you? Come on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's not feeding us toward the good stuff. Okay, stand up. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right, everybody, electrical outlet. God is our power source. God is our source of victory. Take those two hands. Just, just plug them into the Lord right now. Close your eyes and connect with the Lord. Say, God, here I am. I connect with you. I connect with you. Tell the Lord, I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. I want you, Lord. I want to please you in 2024. I want more of you and more of your will in 2024. I want to break through. I want to see breakthrough in these areas of bondage. Spiritual bondages, sexual bondages, substance bondages financial bondages. Lord, I want breakthrough in these areas. And I'm looking to you. I'm calling on you. Strengthen me. Ask him, Lord, strengthen me by the Holy Spirit to lean into you. Spend time in your word. Pray. And do those things that I ought to do as I ought to do them. Strengthen me, Lord. In the name of Jesus, tell him, say, Lord, I give you 2024 right now. I give myself to you in 2024. I yield to you to do your will. And in Jesus' name, come on, say it out loud. In Jesus' name, I will do the will of God because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In Jesus' name. Let's say amen and clap in agreement today, can we?